and that sort of thing as we get going. So welcome and thanks for coming today. Okay, thanks, Lucy. How is my sound? Good? All right. Yeah. So Lucy mentioned this um, actionable innovations that we had started and um, it's, it was really talking about writing a book on an, an innovation for EDU. Um, and then we thought, um, we, what, what might be interesting to write a book is that to actually get the content you know, can be very, very difficult. So what we've started to do is we publish weekly in Medium. And so we're generating content for a book on innovation in Medium. And we've been doing that. I think I posted five, six articles. Lucy may have posted 10. But this is how we're going to generate the content for the book. And it's also how um, we will then sort of have boot camps around the content once we get it into chapter format. So that's sort of one thing we're, we're doing. And the second thing we're doing to gather content for the book are these conversations. Um, I'm leading the, the first one this evening on what we've learned from education and COVID, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and eventually, really, it's about, um, I guess, the, I've read um, that uh, Thomas Edison, uh, when he was, you know, um, working on innovations, he created this thing called a Junto. And the Junto was a group of people that met every couple of weeks with wide sort of diverse interests. And that's sort of what we were doing with an open call for people to join us in this Junto and see what comes out of it. And so that's sort of the overall view of um, what we're up to. Uh, okay, is that, is chatting. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks Lucy. <laughs> uh, so if you wanna follow us, we're um, on all of these places, Medium, Twitter, Facebook, seriously social media heavy, as you can see. Um, and um, so how does this poll work, Lucy? Is it, are we still using this? You're there, Lucy? Did put the poll in here and let me see if I can launch it. But we're really curious to know um, if your school or organization has done any planning um, around going virtual because it seems to us that um, that that here's the here's the poll uh, it seems that schools have uh, prematurely figured that we were out of the woods with the pandemic and I know that we have some people here from outside the US and it would be it would, I'll, I'll be really curious to learn as we proceed um, how you are, are, are uh, you know, handling the virtual this year, because it seems schools are thinking that they don't need it. And we're seeing it here in the US that we very much do need it. So it looks like uh, most people, uh, Don, have not, their school's not offering virtual so far. So um, sharing this pause, bring your shared. Okay, so um, just thanks for the intro, Lucy. Just quick, some background on me. I'm probably like in the seventh iteration of myself. I tend to reinvent myself uh, when I get bored. Um, I started out as an industrial chemist. So I studied chemistry uh, in Ireland, uh, which is where I was born. Um, I've also, I, I moved to London in the uh, late 80s to because I got set into Imperial College London to a PhD program and I was studying public health engineering. So I, I was playing with different disinfectants to disinfect water. But while I was doing that, I also worked as a photographer because that was my true passion. And I did work in the music industry and fashion industry 
it was very, very hard to sustain. And in the early 90s, um, I got the opportunity to come to New York to teach in an international school uh, to teach um, chemistry, IB chemistry. And it was just an offer um, I couldn't turn down um, because I was so enamored with New York. And so I came to New York and here I've worked as a teacher, as a department chair. Um, I've done a lot with science lab design. So working on designing great science labs for great science teaching. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur. I've started two companies. One was Tools at School, which is now defunct. Um, Tools at School was a, a joint sort of a collaboration between a branding agency in New York called Aruladen, where we worked with students to design, co-design products with real designers and bring those products to market. And we had some success by pushing products out to Staples two years in a row for back to school. So they designed things like desks, uh, backpacks, you name it, any sort of schooly thing that students bring to school. Um, and then I also um, started a company called Rewind We're Set Forward. That was basically a deck, 80 deck of cards that helped you reimagine your learning space in two, uh, in, in two hours. Um, my main sort of expertise at this point is as a design thinker. And um, currently I teach a design thinking class at Columbia University and a graduate class, which is a second semester class. But I also teach entrepreneurship at a um, high school here in the city, Marymount School in New York, which is where I am broadcasting from tonight in one of their idea labs, uh, a, class, a space where students uh, learn about creativity, innovation, imagination and entrepreneurship. And so that's a quick, quick, not too long background on me. Um, so um, I guess I'm, I'm calling this, why are we throwing remote learning out the window now that we are going back to school physically? And that comes up, um, as you know, when we went into the pandemic, um, whenever it was, I was so discombobbled with time, um, we you know, had to be remote. And I did a lot of groundwork um, with this school in Marymount because what I found was there was a big problem with dissonance or just this Zoom fatigue. And I learned that it was because from sitting and staring into a screen all day and your mental abilities were out of sync with your physical abilities. So I became obsessed with tracking cameras and trying to sort of get people up from their seats and stuff like that. And, and I was thinking earlier, why didn't I use the tracking camera tonight? But anyways, I'll, I'll use it some other time for you. But, um, but that's where I started to get really curious about uh, remote. And, and I felt I'd seen a lot of successes, which I'll talk about with remote tonight and telling you what I did both at the university level and at the high school level. Um, so that's sort of the premise of um, this, uh, brief talk tonight. It won't be too long. There'll be plenty of time for uh, questions. So sort of um, if my mantra that I was broadcasting for right throughout the uh, pandemic was that if in-person teaching was like theater, then online had to be like HBO. And how might we engage an audience like HBO engage us? And that was how I was always start, I started to think that way when I was pushed into do remote. Anyone that knows me knows that um, I so love being physical in spaces and you know, in the work that I do, it's all about the physicality, people in a room, uh, ideating whatever way I work with design thinking. So for me to push into this space digitally was pretty brutal. I would say for six months, I, I felt I had a creative thought um, and of course it was because I wasn't interacting with people outside. I wasn't going to art galleries. I wasn't going to museums. It was, it was tricky. But anyway, so this has always been on my head about thinking like HBO. Um, so let's talk first about what I did at Columbia to make my class more engaging. Um, I teach a second semester class um, at Columbia Teachers College and uh, with Rashawn Richards. And the class is essentially using design thinking to solve school problems. Often it's to do with tech, but you know, it can be any aspect of the school, the lunch program, the room design, you name it. I take them through methods and mindset of 
DT. And so um, the first thing I did with my class, which had to be completely redesigned, it runs second semester, 15 classes, two hours a session. And I really had to think about the redesign. And the way I started to think about that was with user experience. And really, if you're designing any experience, you really need to use the user experience principles, which I are really, I use five. It's attract, exit, extend, attract, enter, engage, exit, extend. So you think about those five tenets and you design your lesson around that. Often as educators, we focus on the piece, which is the engagement, which is when the students are in the classroom, but to really complete the design cycle and complete a better design experience for your students, you really need to teach Think of the attract, enter, engage, exit, extend. So keep those five in mind as we plow through this. Um, and so um, the first thing I did is um, I found, I was looking for a sort of a digital collaboration tool. And the one that I settled eventually with was Mural. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this. It's also very like Miro and there's a uh, jam board I think Lucy mentioned yesterday but basically it's a huge wide collaboration space where everyone can be in at once a lot of people find it overwhelming but essentially um, I use this uh, tool uh, to do all of our activities and I should backtrack and say with the two hour class I brought it down to one hour I felt two hours was too long to be in line so I had to redesign as much lessons as I could um, into this one hour activity um, the other thing that we did was we uh, had a synchronous class followed by an asynchronous class followed what, what we call just 15 minute signups. And so, so that format changed all the time. And that's important in, in design as well, that you actually change the format of your classes, that they're not the same. So we did week sync, a week async, and then a 15 minute sign up. And that was more for us to get to know the students. It could be totally social, but it could also be, was there something they were stuck on? Did they need more information about it? And honestly, I've never got to know my graduate students better in the last nine years that I thought this course by just having these short slots, because that never happened when I went up to Columbia once a week for two hours. I mean, I got to know them, but not to that intimate level. So that was like a huge benefit, I, I feel, for the students and for me. I got to know them so much better. Um, so thinking about that, that was a, a great thing that that worked, that would not, that never existed before the pandemic. You know, I wasn't having these relationships with them. Um, the other thing that I had to radically change for this class was um, the end deliverable. Okay, and the end deliverable uh, of this 15 year, 15 week experience, my graduate students always ended in what was called pitch night. And so what Rashan and I do is we would take, we would have pitch stations in three corners of the room. And then in the fourth corner, there was a food station. And the idea was that, um, you know, the way normally with pitches, people get up in front and then the audience listens. And I think you do this as well with some of your students that are presenting projects. But after a while, there's a lull and people are no longer engaged. So what we did with our culmination was and this is for the physical class, it was this people in three corners and food station. And then what happened is uh, groups pitched at the same time. So you'd group one pitching and I would bring in about 20 people to give them feedback. They could be entrepreneurs, other educators, students, past students, whatever. And you would do your pitch, your three minute pitch. And then that group that gave them feedback would move on to the next corner, give, listen to that pitch, move on to the third corner, listen to that pitch. Um, and what was happening as well with this is that my students pitched three times, then they got to join the group who was giving feedback. So it became way, way more interactive and much more engaging. Now, how do you replicate that online? Because this was like such a buzz in the room with these, you know, multiple pitches. And people were concerned about sound in this. It wasn't a problem. You know, this, they, it, it totally worked. And of course, having the food was another. Having a food station was a big part of this uh, pitch night design. It's important that there's food there and drinks for people to reach to um, and stuff like that. So this was, I think, one of the biggest challenges we had. Um, 
with redesigning the pitch night. So this is what I came up with. Um, and there's a pastiche of it behind. It looks like a real mess. And it was, and it was intentionally designed like this. So what happened was um, I got them to submit a two to three, five minute pitch in advance. And I built, I, I embedded all these pitches on these boards, but the charge as we just played these, which was, you know, again, a bit mundane watching a short clip, but that clip was to be like, like a trailer. I had the students uh, give feedback in that graffiti form. So what's that slide that you're looking at that looks like a total mess would have started with like a clean image of a, um, the, the, the movie, uh, the presentation of the students in a movie format. And then um, the students were commenting, giving feedback. And this was a great way to engage the students as opposed to just watching the image. Um, and so the, those things were how I um, redesigned the whole learning experience to have it be COVID uh, sort of proof, if you will. And before I move on to my next example, I'm happy to take questions if they're fresh in people's mind on anything that I've said so far. <laughs> Any questions? Is there stuff in the chat, Lucy, which I'm not monitoring? There's a lot, there's a lot of conversation going on. We we're talking about mural versus Moreau um, versus, uh, you know, but basically that what's leading up to here is having that digital infrastructure and and thinking about the workflow and the, the user experience of um, of people, I think is I think the takeaway from this is is that that's become more paramount during the age of COVID. I think that's probably one lesson for all of us is like, what does that experience look like for for all of us, uh, students and kids alike, and how do you how do you design for the whole experience, not just the the academic piece? Right. Um, um, Hans was talking about how how his his wife is a principal, and every kid got an iPad, and and um, that helped with remote teaching. But now that they've gone back to in person and and more traditional school, it's the, the lasting effects are still there from having to be digital. So I would love some elaboration on that. If if I'm Mike or um, if anybody else wants to jump in there, I'd be really curious to hear about that. Can everybody? Everybody can unmute, right? Okay. There's Hans. I see Hans is is unmuted. Yep, maybe he's not there. Um, anyway, so I, I think, um, uh, Don, can you see the chat at all? Pardon? Can you see the chat at all? It's which channel? The chat? The chat. No, I have it. I have it off because there's too much going on on my screen. Oh. You want me to look at okay. something? So, so uh, Robin is asking what the subject of your course is at Columbia. Yeah, it's um, using design thinking to solve problems in school, mainly tech problems. And so, Robin, he teaches this with Rashawn Richards, who's the um, another Apple Distinguished Educator, who is um, he's the the founder of uh, the co-founder of Explain Everything. If you've ever have have used that app, it's another whiteboarding app. And if any, I'm happy to share the syllabus with anyone that wants it. Um, just, you know, contact Lucy or I, and I can get you, uh, you know, it's on Canvas, which I can't let you in, but I have a version that I can share with you as a PDF if you're curious about the content um, and all of that. The other thing that Bill brought up is that having a, a backend, Mural, Slack, um, WordPress, blogs, whatever, what have you, is important because Zoom seems to be um, about the hero presentation, traditional stage on the stage teaching rather than communal construction. So what are the tools like mural for that communal together, um, traditional sit and get kinds of lectures? Right, sure. 
I should just tell you all, as I might not have been clear with this, but this was a fully remote class, okay? Completely remote with students in New York, from New York to Beijing. So like I was navigating time zones. Um, it, it was brutal on the, the, the students that were, you know, 12 hours, 14 hours ahead. I actually moved it to later in the evening. We always, you know, wasn't, wasn't a tradition, was a traditional 5 p.m. East Coast time class, but we moved that to seven at least, do you know what I mean, or sometimes eight. Okay. And and you also the you know when you when you are doing this class in person and I'm assuming next spring you're going to be doing it in person, the other the other thing that Don does that I really have really enjoy and then I've I've tried to adapt in my own work is is the idea of 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 taking your students on a on a learning voyage, and so um, and I, I'll let him talk about that a little bit. But basically, uh, when he and I worked with a school in New York about seven years ago, he would take the administrators outside of the school to see different innovative places. And the idea is that I, I think particularly right now, um, schools are really inwardly focused and how do you bring that outside influence in? And Don, do you wanna talk a little bit about your learning voyages and how that adds to this experience? And I guess my question for you, Don, would be, how do we do virtual learning voyages? How do we bring that kind of experiential piece into this if we if we have to do remote and hybrid teaching? Yeah, so simple answer, Lucy is you can't, not possible, impossible. I mean, I tried everything. <laughs> I mean, just the history of voyages. I'm a, when I pitched this class to Teachers College Columbia, my, my pitch to the head of the department was, I want to design a course that the 15 lessons that will happen, the 15 learning experiences will happen in 15 different locations. And basically they told me to buzz off. They said, that is crazy because I feel you need to be people outside of their environments. And so what I did was, um, because I always do what I want anyway and suffer the consequences later as Lucy knows that's the way I operate, um, is I decided I would take them out occasionally. So I usually design what I call three voyages over the 15 week experience. Uh, voyage one was to Steelcase, a furniture showroom where they were immersed in different types of school furniture. And I would have them uh, look and observe, take photographs to hone their observation skills, but also that the charge after that was to design a classroom of their choice, be it a library or a rec or a, it could be a cafe or it could be a science lab, it could be um, anything. And um, the second voyage was always to a software company where they interacted with software engineers and designers so that they could see, particularly one that we usually went to was, um, what's Andrew's company again, Lucy, the, the video one? Brain pop. Brain pop. So that they could see how educational software was designed. And then I often brought them to a Brooklyn Navy Yard so they, they could see shared studios, which are these pop-up goal spaces where you can interact with people from other countries. So looking at that experience, it's really amazing product if you've never seen it, shared studios. So that was the history of the voyages. And honestly, when we were redesigning this course, I. I couldn't find a virtual voyage, even once I looked at that came close to and that. So those, that's where I substituted in. How can we be more intimate with the students? How can we get to know them more? And that's where we had the drop-ins, these casual drop-ins, you know, where it was, you know, you could have a, a virtual drop-in, which is you could have a drink or, you know, talk about sushi or it didn't matter or talk about what you just watched, but really just getting to know the students more. And it could also be academic. It was their choice. So that's what I subbed the voyages for Lucy. The voyages didn't make sense. I'm so glad to be going back. Um, but I don't know if I'll be able to take them on voyages because right now, and we'll talk about this in my next case study, uh, you know, they're not allowing people back into schools. So I, I don't so, know. So here... So here's something I, uh, to think about. Uh, when I was teaching online courses for National Lewis University and um, a dean from there happens to be with us. Hi, Arlene, it's good to see you. Um, I, I would have weekly drop-ins that were optional for students to hear um, from um, different experts who wanted to share their, their expertise with people. So Gary Steger came in one time. Um, 
uh, Sylvia Talisano, who unfortunately passed away last spring, came in. So I'm so glad I have a recording of her talking to my students about um, blogging and using social media with students. You know, I, I you know, and it was it, I didn't want to make it required because it was an asynchronous class, and they got extra credit for coming. But the whole idea was to show them that the world was their oyster, and 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 that if you get connected online these opportunities to learn from people um, are there and for the taking really. And, and so, um, and, and the reason that I started doing that too, par partially you're influenced on, but also I went to, draw, I dropped in at a, a friend of mine who's a, who's a TA for, for Chris Didi at Harvard one summer. And they had a guy from NetDragon um, who coincidentally uh, bought Edmodo, uh, Kate, um, uh, giving a kind of a, a guest noon lecture to students at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And they invited me in to listen. And he, the, C, the CEO of this company, which is the, I guess the largest gaming company in the world, um, was talking about some new PowerPoint product uh, that they had developed, which really didn't excite me. But what was interesting to me was that what the Harvard experience gets you is that you get these connections and, and real life scenarios that wouldn't normally come up in 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 um, you know in, in in everyday life, I guess. And so you know the students there had the opportunity for people who wanted to come to Harvard and share what they knew. And and I don't know if that's a normal experience in every college and university. So the I thought that I would tap my network to come share their their passions and interests. Um, in order to kind of replicate that experience and we did it virtually. So I, I don't think it's the same as a learning voyage by any means, but like thinking about how we can bring in people to expand either, you know, whether whatever age student, uh, whether it's, we're talking about graduate students or, or K-12 students, you know, what can we, how can we bring in experiences digitally that will expand their horizons is something that always intrigues me. And yeah, it's not the same as, as physical, um, being there, but um, I think in this day and age, we have to sell for what we can get, right? Mm. Okay. Uh, there was something else I was going to say about this too, but um, but I can't re I can't remember. Robin's asking, um, how can you talk a little bit more about how your your feedback landed on your students posted graffiti style on mural, and then what did the students behind the various pitches do with that feedback? Where did it go next? So um, because that is the culminating one, um, they, they can decide to continue with that deliverable if they want. And I've had students that actually will do a second iteration or prototype of what they did. Um, that, that happens usually. I would say if I have six projects, I'll get one that's continued beyond the classroom. If I get that, that's pretty good. And I can explain a bit more about that, what happens in the next class that I teach on entrepreneurship, if that answers your um, question. If anybody wants to grab, you know, unmute, you can talk, you don't have to chat either. You can, you can talk in the, and grab, a, grab the mic and, and ask questions too. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, so Dan, um, where would you like to go next? Yes, yeah, so will I jump on with my second case study? Sure. Okay, so um, what you're seeing a juxtapose here. So you've seen me on camera, you know, shouting my head off the last, spouting off the last half hour, but actually um, the location I'm in is what you're seeing on the screen. So it's when you see that co contrast of where I'm sitting and that's the exterior of the building where I am. And um, in fact, the room I'm in would be if you um, go to the uh, third, I guess the second floor, is that what it's called in American, Lucy? Um, so if you, not the floor, mm -hmm. light, but the one above, I'm not in the bay window, but I'm in the window in the middle. So there'd be a bay window with two windows. And then there's a third window that I'm right inside there. And then there's two more over with their other classrooms, just to give you some context of where I am. But this is Marymount School, New York, located on Fifth Avenue and 84th Street. and um, I'm working, I, I, I finished a project with them about a year and a half ago. Um, they're building a new campus in East Harlem for sixth 
6th through 12th grade, 12-story uh, 12 building, and I did all the program design. And whilst doing that, um, I'm really interested in electives in school. My, my mantra about that, so my HBO theater um, mantra that you heard about, um, remote learning, my mantra about schools is that the elective is the new major. So I feel to be innovative in schools is very hard, can be very hard to do it in the traditional areas of academics where there's a hierarchy. And we all know that high school is mainly all about getting kids into college, not, not necessarily always learning, which is the second sort of thing that's, it's, it's, it, it ha happens. Um, but anyway, this is Marymount School of New York. Uh, it's a uh, N through 12th grade, all girls schools, part of a network of schools which have campuses all over the world. And it has four of these idea lab spaces. But um, what I was, I came back here in the fall and I'd been teaching um, this entrepreneurship elective for, um, I don't know, four or five years to high schoolers. And it's a one semester course and it, it's really a course that I try to emulate what would happen in an incubator if you had an idea and you were brought into a real incubator and you were given the resources and things to actually produce that prototype and try and get it to market. And so what I say to the students is it's a three month elective and after the three months I kick them out or unless they wanna come back and do a second uh, round in the incubator. And so the, the thing about this class is what was so brutal is this was a hybrid class. So I want to talk about people with different interpretations of hybrid. That meant I had kids physically in the room and I had kids remotely all the time. So one week or I would have 10th graders in here and the 11 and 12 were remote. And then the next week, 11 and 12 would be with me and others remote. And essentially the rooms were set up like you see right here. Um, which is individual desks, six feet apart, because I couldn't do collaborative table work like, like I normally did. Um, so, I, you know, my thought in this was, well, how can I democratize this class? How can I, you know, what are the kids doing at home versus what are they doing when they're in here? That was one thing I had to think about. And the other thing was redesigning the course down into really small bites, it seemed. So, um, I start to think about the course as teaching them methods. And um, I use their in-house learning management system, which is Blackboard is the old name for it. I don't know what it's called now, but it's, you know, it's a rum drum learning management system. You know, we all deal with them Canvas, which is what I use at Columbia, et cetera. And basically each 45 minute experience was just on one tile. So it was always very easy for them to sort of go in here and see what we were going to do. So that was a big important part of the uh, design of this course that they I got them into this modus of these sound bites. Each sound bite we would learn something about innovation and design, etc. Um, so, so let's talk. I mean, let's try and get everybody else involved here. You know, the the point of today was really to kind of reflect on some of the learnings that we you know we've had with from COVID teaching and learning. And one, so one I'm seeing here right now is chunking things up. So that it's into different bites, right? Don is 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 how you did your curriculum. What what else, what other what other takeaways do we have here? You asking me or the audience? Or you, I, you specifically? I mean, so 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 chunking up your curriculum, mm -hmm. making things interactive, and 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 co-constructing that knowledge through tools like Mural has been another takeaway for you. What, yeah. Um, well, that was the one that was similar. Let me jump to the next slide, Lucy. So again, the way I found Mural as a great tool for remote learning, and um, what I felt where it was different for this is that it democratized the class. So if you were at home or you were in school, you were having an identical experience. And that was, I think, really important for the students, mm -hmm. you know? And it, it, that very simple thing of keeping it all digital, which I loved it because I love you know, doing physical stuff. And um, that, that was the, the second piece that worked really well. And you know what, it worked so well. I, I, I was designing, again, redesigning the class because that's what I love to do because I'm, I'm starting to teach it next week again, actually two sections because it's become popular. Um, is I was thinking, should I go back to paper or should I just keep going with this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what, I, I don't know. I, I started to print out stuff today 
And then I was looking at my mural boards and I was like, shit, these were actually pretty good. What should I do? I so think, I, 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 think I think here's what's going to happen, I think, based on what's already been happening in the South, is that the reality is that kids are going to be quarantining left and right. And so you're, if you go back to paper, then what's going to happen to those quarantine kids? And too many schools, and my son's high school has been one of these, but they're changing, have said no more remote, no more you know, accommodating kids who are going to be outside of school. They think it's all or the other. It's what it's one way or the other. They can't. And they, you know, a, which I understand because it's so hard to teach with when you have remote kids and you have kids present and you feel like you have to be paying attention to both groups. I, I totally get it. But what the problem has been this fall, I think school's been open two or three weeks now, is that their kids have to quarantine, like even if they have the sniffles. I mean, like, if, you know, it's it, they're pretty strict about the quarantining. And the kids have not been allowed to list, even listen in on a, on a class. And in the case of more traditional classes, you know, math, you know, things that are really based on, you know, day-to-day -day interactions with your teacher, the kids are feeling like they missed out. So they, they um, in Henry's high school, they, they um, did a change.org petition and asked the school to rethink this. And so, um, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it, this is a conundrum for schools that are, they're going to have to navigate. It's a, it's a large suburban high school where Henry went, there's a union involved. There's a lot of kinds of nuances that have to, <laughs> have to be worked out in order to shift into this new mode. So for your sake, I'm just saying <coughs> it's not going to go back to completely normal. I think you're going to be shocked by it Yeah, and everybody else is going through it. Yeah, and then there's been a lot of quarantine. Yeah, but the, the reason I started to think physical is again was the school was pretty made a statement that there wasn't going to be remote learning, that like it was going to be as physical as possible. And I think that's where my thinking was. But I'm I'm with you, Lucy. I, I'm always thinking there should be a remote option. For instance, what if the student has a doctor's appointment but can get home quicker than school or, or just has a sniffle and has to stay at home? why wouldn't I engage them virtually? To me, it's better than no engagement, you know? So I'm all for a student like logging on on the way to the game, which is what, you know, they're like, they've gone to a basketball game or something. Well, yeah, log on for 30 minutes to see what's happening in entrepreneurship, you know? If the kid, if, if, if you're at a school that's, you know, pre-K to 12 with kids under 12 who are not, who are not uh, vaccinated, I think that this is going to be the reality. Maybe it'll be different in high schools, but, you know, Henry's high school is completely separate from any elementary kids and, and, and they've had to have kids go in and out. Um, one of the things that, that, that Bill is saying, and I wish Bill would jump in, um, um, the thing about paper is that it, it's, it's situated, it can only be in one place and in one form, but the beauty of digital is that it's protein. It can take lots of forms and exist in multiple places all at once. It's multivalent. Those are a lot of big words, Bill. M multivalent. Um, it's, it's, it operates okay. on several levels kind of all at once. And the great thing is kids can, the, the students can take it, reshape it, make it into anything that they want to make. So you can see in these, these diagrams that Don's putting up that, you know, people are, some people are going to be meticulous with a particular kind of placement. Other people are going to be kind of crazy, but you can see all of that and process all of that. And that sparks new ideas in one another. So you've got this communal creation that's going on, whereas, you know, paper is static and it's, it's a, a book can only be in one place on a library shelf, but a digital file can be remixed and can exist in a thousand places at once. And I think that's a real advantage for teachers who are thinking about this kind of reshaping like why would you ever go back to that one place on a shelf or that one static document that has to that you literally would have to cut up with scissors to remix when you know you could you can do all these kind of crazy things with digital files mm -hmm. yeah definitely. let's see another thing that i think has become more and more important this is Jeline. Uh, is differentiation. We have to personalize and differentiate learning so that it's authentic and relevant to the learners. Uh, and that's as true for adults as it is for students, but we really need to, to take advantage of the growth we've had with Linda, you know, with using technology in a digital format for education 
and look at what's worked and what didn't work and how we can do it better and really okay. differentiate and personalize for our students to get them more engaged. So I agree with that totally. Yes, so, so you can see, like again, I, I did redesign that a big part of this course was guess I would bring in live entrepreneurs into the class so that the students can interact with these entrepreneurs, see what they're like, you know, what do they, how do they dress, what do they say, what are they thinking? And that was sort of relative, a bit easier to sort of replicate in, in, in the hybrid situation because we weren't allowed guests, but so they all came in remote. Okay, so that was an easy one. Um, Again, those guests giving them different point of view. So that sort of much stayed the same and I will keep that the same in this course. It didn't affect the course much. The virtual guests I felt worked pretty well, you know, um, and I would, obviously we can't have guests in school so I'll be getting virtual guests. And again, I'm thinking about who might want, if there's any entrepreneurs in the audience, please let me know because I'd love to invite you into my class. <laughs> to get diff it's all about different points of view. Um, and then, of course, this always ends in a culminating project. It would design a system service um, and come up with a prototype. Um, and again, I'm just showing you a final mural board here of how they would organize themselves on their project. So, you know, I built out mural boards for each group. And then there was calendar and, you know, all sorts of stuff that they would put in there. And a lot of in interesting things in the projects that came out of this were all about learning management systems and redesigning Zoom and stuff like that, because that was what the students were curious about. Experiencing. So one of the things you, you mentioned, too, about these mural boards preparing for class, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, and then I remembered what I was going to say earlier. So don't I want to mention this, too. But I remember you saying that each of these boards that you prepared for, you know, took two, three, four hours to kind of get in the right format, like the preparation for you changed as a teacher, um, the amount of time and the kind of time that you there or the kind of tasks you're doing with that time uh, shifted and you had to be more thoughtful, more intentional and mindful of the student engagement piece in, yeah. in designing these learning experiences where, you know, some teachers might, I'm thinking have been kind of on, on autopilot if they've had following a set curriculum or whatever it's not just the curriculum anymore it's how you present it and how you how you engage the students with it and and not and, and we're not having enough, enough discussions about that and I think this also leads to um, um, Bill's kind of pedagogical model that he's developing too so I just want to throw that out there and then I have one more thing to say at the end one, one more thing you or me? At, at the end, at the end, at okay. the end after. Yeah, yeah, so that, yeah, it could take up to four hours to design these boards, but you know, I am a designer, so I, and I'm, uh, I, I think it's really important that things look the way they do and that people aren't confused, they know where to go. And um, you know, that's an important part of the learning experience. And so I would spend a lot of time designing these boards. Um, and the other thing that I realized is that, well, the activities would always go quicker online than they did offline. So you actually had to do more or do, do the activity twice. You know, I was noticing that. So these were all sort of interesting learnings for me. Um, but, um, you know, essentially in closing, I'll just say, yeah, I had to completely redesign, think differently about these experiences, one for the all remote one and one for the hybrid one. And it looks like I, I have a physical kids physically back. I have doesn't seem like I have any remote kids. So that will be, um, again, a different experience. Because again, I think it, as you guys have said, it will be a mix of both. You know, will I? It's I can't, it can't be all digital, um, but it will be some of both. I think. Um, so, so to wrap up uh, or to add on to what you're saying. Um, Today I had a conversation with John Edelson, who is a long time, I think he's retired now, professor in California. Um, he's had his hands in a lot of different pots. His son is the C, as we mentioned yesterday, is the CTO of Zoom. Um, and he brought up this learning community that um, I have to find the name of it now, that is that was born out of a need of COVID. Um, and that was to get Zoom help and support just in time as we were moving into the pandemic. And I posted it in our Slack and I'm just looking for the name of it. 
And this group started meeting on Saturday mornings um, uh, for, you know, at the start of the pandemic and it's become a thing. And he is on, it's called Office Hours Global. And so it's officehours.global and I'll put it in the, in the link. And, um, and it's people like sharing their pain points and getting help and, and different um, streaming experts sharing their expertise. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting example of, of how, um, how self-directed learning kind of changed because of the, of the pandemic. And there is an education section part of this too. That's really interesting that meets I think after the traditional Saturday morning meeting, um, and John wants to talk to uh, come back to our group and talk to us about, about it some more, and and thinks um, this might be actually a really good model for what we're trying to do here. So um, I just wanted to make sure that I shared that with you because I thought that you know I, I think that it's really I don't think this pandemic is going anywhere for the for the foreseeable future. I saw a poll today of doctors who think it's never going to go away. Um, and not that we're going to be teaching in this, in this precarious mode forever, but I, I think that we have to be, there's a reason to really think about how we're shifting things and it's not temporary. Um, and in some places, maybe the shift to digital has stuck better. Um, in other places, I, I'm not so sure about that. So anyway, I, I just wanted to point that out to everyone and then to kind of, um, give you an idea of what we're up to. Um, you can follow us on these different channels, but there's also, um, if you want to get more involved with what we're doing, a, there are three ways to kind of get involved. One is you can come to these meetings and, and participate as you feel comfortable. And hopefully we'll get to the point where there's, where there's more people on camera talking. Um, and that's one basic level to do that. The second one is if you want to write with us and contribute to our group publication, and potentially some of that content may, may take the form of a book at some point. We'd love to have you, and it doesn't have to be anything earth shattering, but, but simple articles on things that you're thinking about related to innovation and education. Um, Don has been really great about kind of chunking up different topics related to design thinking. And, and um, so we're just getting started with that and we'd love to have people help with that if they'd like to. And then the third way to get involved, if you want to, is kind of a deeper dive. And that's kind of helping this group take formation and guide um, uh, how, we're, how, we're, how we're forming if we ever move into a consultancy kind of mode, um, hopefully getting some projects that we can work on together. Uh, but with this particular group, Julene and Bill and some other people who are in the room, let me see who's here. Um, uh, I saw, Alex here for a little while ago, Catalina, we're, they're part of this, this deeper dive group where we're meeting regularly, we're talking about things and we're sharing things in a Slack, in a Slack setup. So if you want to do any of those things and get more involved with us, I think the whole point of this has been to kind of build a, um, I think a lot of us are missing kind of a professional learning community where we can grow and then our ideas are going to be, um, explored and, and challenged and stretched. And so hopefully this group will, will at the very least provide a, opportunities for networking and from learning from each other in a way that's, um, you know, a little bit more like we used to do in, you know, face-to-face -face, um, in terms of, of um, building relationships and that sort of thing and connections. So that's what we're really about. Our next conversation, if you, uh, my email's on the next slide, Don. If anybody wants to get involved and, and that sort of thing, contact me and, and we'll, we'll be happy to talk to you about that. And then on the last slide, um, we've switched to Zoom for the next three meetings um, because the platform that I envisioned working well for us didn't work very well yesterday. And it's not as simple as, as putting earbuds on. Um, there seems to be some other issues at play that we're, we're looking into right now. So for our next three kickoff sessions will be in Zoom and they're all listed on Eventbrite and in multiple other places. Tomorrow is our next one with Amy Yurko, who is a school planner, which means that she's an, archi she's an architect by trade, but she kind of translates 
the education piece to the architects and serves as a liaison between the school and the architect te architectural team. And she's absolutely brilliant like everybody else is in our group. And um, we're gonna talk about the future of learning spaces. Now that we've kind of debriefed about uh, lessons learned from COVID, we want to kind of dive into, okay, so what are the possibilities? Now that we were here, how do we move forward as, as opposed to retract? And, um, and then next week, we'll be talking about the future of educational technology. And people may not know what the last one is about. It's about funding. And this may not be of interest to people outside the US either, but there's a ton of stimulus money coming to US schools. And this third round called of ESSER funding, uh, elementary, secondary, blah, 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 whatever it's called. Um, it's a ton of money that can be that has relatively loose guidelines around how it's being spent. And, and my fear is that it's going to be spent on things that address learning loss, which I think is an artificial term in terms of what's happened to kids during the pandemic. And um, so anyway, we're going to talk, Julian is, and a couple other people are going to facilitate that session um, next Thursday as well. And I want us to kind of be creative and brainstorm about what are some ways that we can use that funding so that people are not, um, I don't know, I just don't want to see all that money go to tutoring services because I don't think that's particularly innovative. And I think most of you would agree. So that's where we're at. Um, if you want to know more, send me an email um, and Don and I would be happy to talk to you. And, and tomorrow, join us if you feel like it, same time, same place um, with Amy Yurko. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. It's gonna, you know, the more that we get going with this, um, uh, the the more we're going to, uh, uh, I think the more engaging it's going to be. Our, our previous conversations amongst ourselves have been pretty loose and informal. And I think we will we'll get there. We'll get that, that mojo back um, as we get going. So thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we'd love to, we're glad to have you here and we'll see you at one of the next convenience. Thanks everyone. Bye all. And I'm going to stop recording in a second. There we go.